And the lesson is called Sarah Laughed. And uh, I think that, that'll bring to mind for most of you exactly what we're talking about in the Bible. And, and this is a, a well scripture, but we're going to look at it in a different way. And this is something I picked up from a Jewish site. I've talked about that before that I wander around in a couple different Jewish sites looking for interesting things. And and, and I, I also warn you, if you choose to do that yourself, be careful because a lot of the stuff they teach is not correct stuff. And and um, particularly if anything that they're, they're talking about has anything to do with the Messiah, that will be a twisted mess of, of things and, and stay away from it. And that strikes in places where you wouldn't expect. Um, it actually hits in Genesis. Um, because there's that prophecy about the, the Messiah that begins right with the, uh, the original sin. And they have that twisted up in a way that you wouldn't believe. So if you ever do that kind of thing, um, looking at Jewish sites, uh, be very careful what you read and what you accept from them. But in any case, they do have some good stuff. And the reason is that they speak the original language and, and that gives them a big advantage. They, they understand nuances of the words that we don't and, and things that are lost in translation. And so we always need to be aware that the English translations that most of us work from um, are done by Christians whose first language is not Hebrew. And, and as a result of that, they have some biases and they also have a little lack of understanding. And we also need to understand a bit of the history of Christianity. And I've talked about this many times before. And that is that for 2000 years, Christians really despised Judaism and Jews generally. And the Catholic Church went so far as to kill a whole bunch of them just for the fun of it. So, um, and so many uh, many people, even today, uh, in churches reject the Old Testament as being a valued Christian. You can find a lot of churches that just won't teach from the Old Testament because they think it doesn't apply to Christians. And, and that's a wrong idea, too. So uh, we, we need to understand that the English translations that we work from are, are um, not always good. And, and so while we were hating the Jews for those 2,000 years, uh, plus another 2,000 before that, the Jews have been doing very detailed studies of the Bible. And it's in their own language, so they had, had the advantage of picking up nuances and things that we don't see. So this is an interesting one that I found. We're going to be looking at Abraham and Sarah, the story there. And this is where the three visitors come to announce the, the coming birth of Isaac, and also Sarah's response to that announcement. And, and that's where Sarah laughs, if you remember the story. I think you probably all do. Um, and, and so uh, we're also going to look at God's announcement of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's negotiation with God to stop that destruction of, of Sodom. And, and, and uh, we'll see some interesting things through all of that. And so you know the story well, it, like I said, well-worn territory, um, but we're going to look at different aspects of it. So I think you'll find some new things here. And so our goal here is going to be uh, not just to look at that story, but to see how to reason using the Bible. And, and so uh, in this case of, of Sarah Lafts, um, we're going to be um, asking questions like, are we understanding the context of the, the scripture that we're reading? Do we really understand the culture of that time and the linguistic uh, of that time? And, and uh, or do we understand the speaker's mental state? And, and are, the, are the words that we're reading really being understood by us correctly? And that can be a real problem a lot of times. Um, we can't tell if a person, and, and it'll come up here, is, is a person laughing and what that means by laughing? Or is it a a sad laugh or a happy laugh or an ironic laugh. Um, and, and so we often don't get that kind of information from the, te the text and we have to use other factors to give us some understanding of that. And so those are kind of questions we're gonna be looking at and we're gonna be trying to bring more information in to help us understand uh, what's going on with Sarah there. And, and there's other places, um, or we're going to look for other places where um, God or an angel or a prophet uh, gives a prophecy about the future, but that uh, prophecy is met with either laughing or doubt. And, and, and there are cases in the Bible where that happens, where the person that is being told this prophecy essentially expresses doubt and, and, um, and what happens to that. And that's going to help inform us about what's happening with Sarah. Yeah, you, uh, did you, I, I believe you mentioned before that there was a Bible that you used for your studies for your preparation for the lessons. I, I, what is it? Did you say it was uh, English? You know, uh, it's it, it's an Aramaic. Um, okay. That that's the Bible that I use. But I quite often use interlinears, um, so that I can get some understanding of the original Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. I, I know a few words, but that's all. Um, and and so I use interlinears to do the translation for me and, and give me the option of looking at um, what the original words were and and considering whether they were actually translated well. Mm -hmm. And, and you and I have had some discussions uh, about different translations. 
And you can look at different Bibles and, and they've really taken it in different directions in certain places. And, and one is understanding the verse this way and one is this way. And it's a really different, uh, big difference between that. And so that's the kind of things you, that you can dig out if you use an interlinear like that. I think the problem with using a, a modern version of the Bible is whether they intend to do it or not, but if they have an agenda or not, but they'll leave off something very important. And some of them, I'll give an example, the NIV, for example. So what I've done is I have about four in, in one, four mm -hmm. Bibles in one, and I just cross-reference them and check them out. And I realized there's quite a few times that one of them going off on a tangent, you know. Mm -hmm. So years I always get a little bit more comfort in seeing Read maybe the new King James, you know, for example. Um, but you're right. There, there's, there's a, uh, and I also have another one that has Greek on there, you know, and Hebrew and all of that. If we, if you do that, you get a better, deeper understanding of it, you know. But I'm not really sure to see if many people care about that anymore. <laughs> That's an entirely different question, but a good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, there's a lot of people who are just doing church. And, and they're happy to do church and um, they're not really interested in learning anything more about God or anything deeper about his word. And uh, just can't do much about that, I guess. Okay, so we're going to start with um, this verse from Hebrews 11. So we're going to start here and talk about Sarah first. And then we're going to go to the actual scriptures where Sarah is met by those three men and, and given the prophecy of the coming birth. And so because Hebrews 11 talks about her. And, and describes her as a faithful person, as one of the examples of great faith in the Bible. So it says, Hebrews 11, 11 through 12, By faith also Sarah, who was sterile, received power to conceive seed, and she was not in the time of her years, and she who was not in the time of her years gave birth, for she was sure that he who promised her was faithful. Because of this, from one who was failing in old age were born as many as the stars in the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore, which has no measure. Okay, so uh, the, the point that Hebrews is making is that she was a, a powerful figure for faith in the history. And remember that it, that it goes through a number of people, Abraham's included in that list, as being great examples of faith and, and people who uh, stayed faithful despite not receiving the promise that was promised to them. And, and so um, this paints Sarah as, as a woman of faith, uh, a strong woman of faith, a person who believed it God's promise and believed that God was faithful, as it says. And so by faith, it says she received power to conceive. And, and so it was by her faith, she had that faith. And she was sure that God was faithful. So we see nothing but a positive, uh, faithful image of, of Sarah here. But we'll see something different in, in many translations of what we see from the actual event where this uh, uh, faith happened. So the English translation of the announcement, and uh, we'll go into the actual verses, but we'll just talk about it a little bit first here. The English translation of the announcement doesn't sound like that. It, it sounds like she laughed when the visitors told her that she was going to give birth. And a lot of people think, well, she laughed because she didn't believe it and, and uh, that she wasn't uh, a woman of faith at that time and, or certainly didn't believe what the, the men were telling her. And then you see that the visitors accused her of laughing and then she denies laughing and the visitors say, yeah, you did laugh. And, and so it, it doesn't sound like um, a woman of faith is involved here. It can uh, be, seem wrong and, and seem like, in fact, that she didn't believe. And in fact, she lied about not believing. And, and so it paints a very different picture if you look at it that way. So we have two different views of this. We have the Hebrew 11 view of her as a, as a symbol of faith, a great symbol of faith um, um, among that limited number that Hebrews 11 lists. So uh, a, a great in, in faith. And, and over here, when you look at the English uh, translation, you, you see it looking like she was really a person who didn't believe what was she, she was being told and then lied about not believing, lied about laughing. So um, we're going to try to reconcile that as we're here. So it seems like a contradiction in the Bible. Uh, and there's many anti-Bible people who look for contradictions like that, and they'll bring those up to you. And they'll say, well, the Bible says this here, and it says this here. The Bible is contradicting itself, therefore the Bible is wrong, and you can't trust it. Or maybe they'll say it was just written by men. It wasn't written by the hand of God. And, and therefore, you can't trust it. So, so be careful of people like that. And sometimes it takes some work to resolve contradictions like that. Um, and these people look for those contradictions and they'll try to stump you on them. Um, and, and so if you, you get in that position, then just accept that uh, you're going to have to do some Bible study to give that person an answer. 
So what we're going to do here is try to resolve that. And, and, and one way that this is resolved by, by people uh, is um, uh, the common way is it's resolved by saying that Sarah didn't believe at first when she was told that, that Isaac was going to be born to her. And but later on, she believed. Now, that's just eisegesis. The Bible never supports that. It doesn't say anything about her uh, not believing at first and then believing later. And, and so it, it really isn't supported by anything in the Bible. But that's just some a method that people use to try and get these things to these two things to match what Hebrew 11 says with what is the actual event description. So it doesn't really line up well because of that. There's there's no support for that kind of an idea. And, and, and nowhere else in the Bible is there ever a hint that Sarah was ever a faithless liar, which is how the, the, she gets painted in that verse. So how do we resolve this? Um, we, we resolve it like we resolve any kind of apparent contradiction in the Bible. We bring in more information from the Bible and not from other people. We don't bring it in from other pastors or other people. Uh, we bring it from the Bible because that's the trustable source. And so we bring in more information and we have to accept that we may not be understanding something correctly. Something that we thought we understood the Bible said may not be understood correctly. And so we have to be prepared to change um, if we find the, the Bible basis on which to change. And, and, and that, um, that's a, a difficult thing to do sometimes because you may have believed something about what the Bible said for a long time. And now you're being faced with the need to, to change. And so that tied to that is being ready to let go of what we currently believe and, and accept a new belief if it's supported in the Bible. So bring in more information. The first thing we're going to bring in is the fact that Abraham is told in advance before Sarah that, that Sarah is going to give birth. And he laughs also, just like her. And he says almost the exact same things that she is going to say when we look at the verse that, about her. So this comes from the chapter before. This is Genesis 17. And it says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah. Uh, shall be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So we see, we're going to see this when we see what Sarah says. And she says pretty much the same thing, but of course, in reverse, she speaks about herself first and then speaks about Abraham being an old man. Uh, and both of them laugh. And then when Abraham does it here in, in chapter 17, God doesn't accuse Abraham of laughing or, or saying anything uh, that would indicate that he doubted, had any doubt in, in what he was being told. Abraham just laughs because it's a crazy idea. Um, he, is, he is so old, he can't, uh, it, it, it seemed insane that, that he would have gone all of his life um, without having a child. And now here he is late in his age, um, he's going to have a child. Um, and, and so, um, his words, like I said, are going to be pretty much identical to what Sarah's going to say. And we know his laugh is not a laugh of unbelief. Uh, it's not a scoffing kind of laugh like a, a mocker would say, well, that's silly. I, I'm not going to accept that. That can't possibly happen. And, and so it's not that kind of a laugh that we see from him. If you have any questions, jump in. Okay, more information we're going to pull in is consequences of unbelief. Um, there are times in the Bible where prophets or angels or God tell someone, some man, something, and they don't believe that. And, and there's uh, commonly a consequence for that. And so we'll look here at um, when the angel comes to Zechariah to announce the coming birth of John the Baptist. So this is from Luke chapter 1, verse 13, and then 18 and 19. And it says, And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you should call his name Johanna. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am old and my wife is advanced in her days. Almost the exact same words as Abraham. But what he wants is, how shall I know this? Okay, continuing on, the, an the angel answered and he said to him, I am Gabriel who am standing before God and I am sent to speak with you and to give you these tidings. Henceforth, you will be dumb. Can't speak. So a, a different thing, what Zechariah here is saying, how shall I know this? I want proof. I want uh, something that will convince me that what you're saying is true. And Gabriel is offended. He says, I am Gabriel. I, I am standing before God. And, and um, I am, I've been sent to send to give you these tidings. And therefore, you're going to be not speaking for the rest of the pregnancy. And, and that's what happens to him. So the consequence of unbelief, when God tells you something like that, 
um, there seemed to be a, a small pattern of, of cases in there where people who don't believe or don't fully believe um, it offends the messenger. And that's what we see here. Zechariah is expecting proof. Um, he's not going to accept this message unless he has proof. But the proof is sitting in front of him. Here's this angel right in front of him. He's, he's uh, at the altar of incense in the temple, uh, which is a place where only the priests could go. So um, he's and uh, so he already has the proof there. Here's, a, here's an angel right in front of you, and you are in an area of the temple where only the priests can be. And and uh, and so um, and also Zechariah is a priest, and you would expect better from a priest. You expect more faith from a priest than that. Uh, so um, neither Abraham or Sarah suffer any consequence for laughing. Uh, and so. Mm -hmm. well, what about that guy that asked God for proof twice? About the ground being dry, the wool being wet, the wool being dry. I mean, he didn't seem to start crying. Yeah. So I think the difference of that uh, it was, you know, it was Gideon, but uh, he was not asking for proof. He wanted a sign. It's a little bit of a difference there. You know what I mean? Proving means like proof to me that you are who you say you are, or you know, in other words, you're questioning God. Whereas sign is is you're asking God to. Yeah, you know, the confirmation that it's all going to work out okay. Because if it wasn't the case, you would have punished him as well. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a bit of a difference there. Yeah, it is. It's an important uh, difference. And that's one of those cases where you have to look carefully at the words to see what the heart of the person is who's speaking. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes because the words don't always convey that so well. Okay, another bit of more information we're going to pull in here is um, the length of, of Sarah's faith. Okay, so she's been told she's going to have this son. How long is it does she need to be faithful um, before she actually sees the uh, evidence that this prophecy is coming true? And the answer is not long, uh, because either she's going to begin menstruation, so there's uh, a minimum of a, of a month there, or, or she's going to become aware that she's pregnant. And, and so once she knows the truth, faith is needed no more. And, and so it becomes a case of she now knows that, that she's going to be having a baby when she thought it was impossible to have a baby. So there's really only a short period of time there where Sarah's faith needs to be in place. And, and after that, she will see the evidence of that faith and, and have it uh, be clear that, that what was prophesied is coming true. So if Sarah doubted, uh, she regained faith quickly to be considered faithful. But that really doesn't matter up because the time the, the, or, or makes sense because the time is so short here. Um, if she doubted, how, how did she so quickly regain faith? And the Bible never talks about that. So it doesn't seem to be supported. And a little bit more information we're going to pull in is the meaning of the name Isaac. And, and that actually is quite important to what we're going to be looking at here. Isaac means laughed. Right? And in a better translation, it is made laughter. That's how they would uh, talk about laughter. It would it would. Um, they didn't have a word that was really equal to laughed. Uh, they would say, I made laughter. And, and so, uh, and he was given that name by Abraham, not by Sarah. And then so Abraham seems to have understood um, what had gone on here with this laughing incident that we're going to be talking about some more. Um, and, and they both laughed, both Abraham and Sarah laughed. We saw the verses for that about Abraham. And then uh, when they were told about the birth. Okay, so now we'll get to the verses, and we begin with the point where the visitors arrive. And so the uh, visitors have arrived. Abraham has invited them to stay for a while and eat some food with them. And, and uh, then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, there, in the tent. So the visitors come in, and they ask this question about where Sarah is. But they know where Sarah is. Uh, this isn't a mystery to them. And so what is their point in asking this question? They want Abraham to know that they want her to hear what they will say to him. And, and so they want Abraham to know that, the, that this is uh, the conversation that's been intended for her. So Sarah listens to them speaking. And, and um, the verse says, he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah, Sarah was past childbearing. So we usually think that Sarah has to get pregnant within three months here. Uh, and so because next year he says, I'll be back. And, and by that time, you'll have a son. And, and so the son uh, is going to, she's going to have to become pregnant fairly quickly here. And, and so the son uh, will have been birthed when the visitor arrives. So just kind of keep that in mind that the time period here is actually pretty short for her to become pregnant. 
And then Sarah laughs. So hearing this, Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have become old, shall I have my pleasure? Shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So again, she said pretty much exactly the same thing that Abraham said. I'm, I am very old. Um, am I going to, is this going to happen to me? And my uh, Lord Abraham, he's old also. And, and so she doesn't, uh, in the same way that Abraham um, isn't expressing doubt when he laughs and says those words, we have to wonder if she is expressing doubt here. And this is the verse where a lot of people say that this is Sarah expressing doubt, but I don't think that's the case. And, and we have the evidence in the things that I've brought there, and I'll, I'll put that in as we go along here. So um, she, she's repeating pretty much exactly what Abraham said earlier. And, and when you look at it, it doesn't really sound like an expression of doubt. It, it, she's saying, I don't believe this. I don't think this is going to happen. Um, give me some proof that, that this is going to happen because I can't believe it. It doesn't sound like that. It just seems uh, more like she's saying, after I become old, shall I have um, this kind of a pleasure? It, it's unthinkable um, in normal terms. And so um, we, we have to wonder about this laugh that she laughs. Um, and, and is it really just a laugh at the irony of having lived her whole life without children? And now when she's in menopause, she's going to be giving birth. And, and I think that that's probably going to be a better understanding of what's going here. I, I don't see doubt in that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Right, right. And that kind of goes, yeah, that kind of goes to the irony of the whole situation. Here I am, um, unable to give birth according to human terms, and, and here I am now in my life when I've never had a child giving birth. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, yeah. And, and so a direct translation of what she says here is, um, says, made laughter, Sarah, within herself, saying, and then it continues on. And so there's that made laughter. Uh, and, and remember when we talked about the name of Isaac there. And, and the boy will be called Isaac, which means made laughter. And, and though no man knew that when the, she was told uh, and when she made this laughter, but that's going to be the name of Isaac. And, and so Isaac is going to be a reference back to that. And we see that here uh, with Genesis 21, 6, after the baby was born and was given the name Isaac by Abraham, Sarah says, God has made laughter for me. And she's uh, play, doing a word play on the name Isaac there, saying, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. Do you follow that? In that case, they're laughing for joy. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of coincides with how she was laughing and or, or what reason she had. But it also means that uh, God is judging the heart, as you were saying earlier. Uh, you you might see somebody laugh, but are they laughing at you? Are they laughing at themselves? Are they laughing? But only God knows what's inside of a person, mm -hmm. you know, what the intent of the heart. Yeah. And so, and so we've seen, and we will see, no consequences for this laughing. Uh, it's not like she's going to become dumb for the rest of her term or anything like that. I have a question, though. Mm -hmm. If this is um, what we're concluding, why would they, the messengers even bring that up in the first place? Why would they even mention, hey, you guys are, why are you all laughing? Why is he, why <laughs> yeah, why exactly. Are yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly where we're going. And, and, and I was just going to say that exact thing. And, and so... Now that it looks, we have reason to believe that there, um, that she was not laughing in a doubting way, that she was laughing in a remarking way or a surprised or ironic way or, or something like that in a happy way. We have to deal with the situation of what the angels say next, and, and that we're going. And then the next slide after this. And, and so um, Jewish scholars say that this is the moment that Sarah began her cycle. And so Sarah is beginning with this announcement here and, and her words, when she makes laughter inside of herself, she makes laughter inside of herself. She begins that process, uh, the Jewish sages say, and, and they say that she begins um, that cycle and that's going to ultimately lead to the birth of Isaac. You see the double meaning of words being used over and over again here? Okay, so, and then a little while later than this, and, and not very much later, but we don't know the length of time, there's a verse in Genesis 21, and it says, Then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, 
and the Lord did for Sarah as he promised. And, and uh, that seems to be the point where she actually becomes pregnant. So it appears that there's a short period of time when um, her womb is recovering from its dormancy and, and, and then she becomes pregnant after that. And, and some people actually wonder from these words whether that means that it was an immaculate birth. And remember that Isaac is kind of a type of Jesus. There's a lot of things that are common between the two of them. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through that in this lesson, but I, I have a lesson that lists a, a large number of things that are very similar between the two of them. And so in a way, he's, he's a type of Jesus, um, but not so much that uh, Isaac is, is an immaculate conception or immaculate birth. Um, but um, and, and we see that in what both Sarah and Abraham say. You can say in their, see in their words that they both expect that Abraham is going to be needed to be involved in this. And, and, and so they, they, we see that because they show a concern for his age and, and whether he's able to do this. And, and so it's, it, there's no reason to believe it's immaculate, but some people wonder about that question. Okay, so Sarah is finished laughing, and, and we get to this verse, uh, which is the one you were asking about. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Okay, so, and, and the question here is, if, if, Lara, if, if Sarah didn't have a laugh out of doubt, then why is this here? What, what, are, what is this uh, telling us? And, and most people, as, as it kind of appears on the surface, take this as an accusation that Sarah laughed in disbelief. Um, but we're saying that it doesn't look like that. There's a lot of other reasons to, to think that it isn't that case. And, and uh, part of that is that it's inconsistent with Hebrews 11 and also the idea that uh, it, from Genesis 17 that Abraham uh, laughed and said pretty much the same things. And, and so we, we wonder, are we misunderstanding something? Is, is there something about this that would indicate um, otherwise, and, and why are why is this coming up? This uh, accus well, it's not an accusation, we say, but uh, why mention Sarah laughing? And and um, and so Sarah's words here tell us a little bit. Um, it says, "After I become whole, old, shall I have pleasure?" My Lord, being old, also, and so this doesn't sound like doubt, uh, more like an amaz amazement thing. Uh, and and so, what do the visitors mean by this? Um, they they say, "Why did Sarah laugh?" And they say, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And they also say, at the appointed time, I will return to you. And so these don't seem the same as Gabriel in, in Zachariah's case, where Gabriel was plainly offended that, that his message wasn't being accepted by Zachariah. These sound different than that. And, and uh, we, we're going to see that there is no consequence like there was with Zachariah. And, and they're not going to do anything uh, to Sarah about this, that, but they do bring up this Sarah laugh thing. And, um, and so the difficult question here is why? Uh, and and uh, this gets actually echo echoed in other places. Um, and, um, and, and it's not an ac accusation here. This idea of, is anything too difficult for the Lord? We see that mentioned twice in Jeremiah. And it's not as, as an accusation in there. It's simply um, the people um, uh, thinking among themselves, is, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is there any limit on what he can do? And, and so that's not an accusation anywhere else in the Bible. So it probably isn't an accusation here either. And, and so I think that it makes more sense to think that uh, Yahweh, and Yahweh is the speaker at this point, uh, his tone is, is inquisitive and not accusational. And, and so um, he's asking, why is Sarah amazed by this? Um, you shouldn't be amazed by this. Nothing is impossible for God. So it's not an accusation. It's, it's just, why would you be so amazed at this? Does that make some sense that way? Wouldn't the Lord already know what she's saying? Yes, yeah, we don't is the problem. And, and all we have is the words to go go from. And and um, and I think that a lot of people uh, misunderstand that. Okay, now comes uh, this part where Sarah denies it. And, and, and uh, she says, uh, or the, the text says, Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. And And so... Uh, because many people understand that Yahweh is accusing her of this, they see Sarah as lying and, and that Yahweh is calling her out for lying. And, and But that wouldn't make any sense here because there's no consequences for that. Um, nothing happens to her. And, and so are we really understanding it correctly if we understand it that way? 
Um, and, and so it, it really seems to me to only make sense uh, if Sarah means I did not laugh in the way you suggest it, it, as a doubting laugh. Uh, that wasn't that kind of a laugh is what she's saying. And, and so she must have been afraid that she was misunderstood. Uh, and it talks about her being afraid uh, and that they think that she was laughing in disbelief, but that wasn't why she was laughing. And, and keep uh, in mind here that the word afraid here in Hebrew um, is the exact same word you would use if you were saying, I feared God or I fear God. And, and so it's an awe, respect, uh, astonishment, uh, fear, not an afraid kind of fear. Can you know what that word? No, I don't. Um, but you can look that up. Um, I mean, I'm using the Strong's, but um, mm -hmm. it says the word is Yare in Hebrew, which is fear to revere. Yeah. Yeah, revere. Yeah. I think we need to have a study on, on <clears throat> those words as well, or names, you know, because of the fact that it seems to me that, that God or Yahweh is called different things depending upon the situation. Mm -hmm. They're different names, yeah. And, and if you lose that, you've lost a great deal of the understanding of the context of what we're talking about there. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting because, I mean, <clears throat> so the way Genesis 1 begins, it has Elohim, which is kind of like the creator of all creation. And then in chapter 2, you have the Tetragrammaton, which is Yohei Wabe, which is whenever he's giving direct instruction to Adam and Eve about, you know, being fruitful, multiplying, and what they can eat. Um, and then also in this in this section of scripture you have when Abram goes to meet them he uses Adonai which means my lord my master but uh, there's a certain way in the vowel pointing between how you use it as like the most high God like a name of God and then you have later on Lot when he sees those messengers and you kind of see like a uh, very similar um, Themes as far as like this is happening in the in the tent, like the door of the tent, and we look at Lot's story when the messengers come, you know, to his home. It's he's like it's the, everything's being taken place like at the door of his house, and so you see Lot at first um, in the vowel pointings. If it's a if it's a kamat, it's a divine name of God, and if it's another vowel pointing that also makes the ah sound, it's it's used uh, as like like what Sarah would use, my Lord, referring to Abraham. And so it's, it's really interesting seeing uh, the different work, the words and needs for God's yeah. nations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that if you have an understanding of the Hebrew, you can pull a lot more out of it, little, little nuances of things that you, you lose completely in a translation, because the translation just can't explain those things without putting an extra paragraph on the verse. Okay, so Yahweh's response here must refer back to what the visitors had said earlier. It doesn't make any sense any other way. So, so they must have really been saying, no, you didn't laugh that way, but you just made laughter. And so they're again playing on this word of Sarah is making laughter. Sarah is making Isaac and conceiving Isaac. And then so this, this making laughter idea seems to come back and, uh, repeatedly here. And, and so Sarah would, wouldn't have understood what they mean by that because she doesn't know that his name is going to be Isaac when he's actually born. And, and so it's kind of a mystery to her, and it's a mystery to most English readers in here because you, you don't have that understanding that Isaac's name is uh, make laughter. And then so, so we've covered that now. Now we're going to talk a little bit more, if I have time, I think I can get in, uh, about uh, the visitors now head off to Sodom. And remember the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the rest of that. And we'll talk a bit about that because it's going to refer back to this. So Abraham bargains with God for Sodom, which is kind of an odd idea, and we'll look at that. Um, Abraham came near and said, will you indeed um, sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away, and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So he says quite a mouthful there, and, and this is an interesting discussion. Um, God hasn't actually said that he's going to destroy the city. He says they're just going to go down to the city and see what's going on because it's come before God that there's a, a, a situation here that is a problem. And, and so he's only said so far that he's going to go down uh, to the city and have a look. But uh, Abraham begins this theological discussion here and he, and he begins to talk about the nature of God. And, and you are a, a God who 
wouldn't do such a thing as to slay all of the uh, innocent, righteous people in the city at the same time you, you would slay the entire city. And so Abraham here begins bargaining. And you remember the rest of the story about him get, narrowing that number down to ultimately 10. Um, and so Abraham seems to be trying to save the whole city. Now, why is he trying to save Sodom, a horrible city that, all, that God ultimately does destroy? Um, and and um, so what, what's his goal here? Is he's trying to use the righteous people in the city to keep the city from being destroyed and, and keep the righteous from feeling any consequences from, or the unrighteous from feeling any conscious consequences of their actions. And so um, it, it seems like an odd idea that he would be bargaining with God this way to, to save the city uh, using the presence of the righteous in there. And, and you would think that he, he would just automatically say, well, God, you're gonna get the righteous people out of there first before you destroy the city, right? But that's not what he says. He gets into this theological discussion about what is right and, and uh, if in a situation where you destroy a city and there are righteous people left in it. And, and so uh, two Hebrew words, and this is where the, the Jewish study was useful here, um, are, are used here that only appear twice in the Torah. And, and so each word appears twice in the Torah. It appears back in that section we just talked about with um, Sarah and the birth of Isaac. And it appears here. And, and so um, people understand from that, that these are linked passages. There's something about uh, Sarah and the announcement of Isaac, the birth of Isaac, that is that relates here to what Abraham is going to be saying in this discussion. And and so hear about Sodom, and, and immediately before that, um, it's, it's talking about Isaac's birth. And and um, and so usually these kind of things in the Bible indicate there's a connection between these two passages. And so we'll take a look to see what that connection is. And so. It seems that Abraham is asking God about justice here. Is it just to destroy the righteous people when you destroy the wicked people? But he never asks about removing the righteous people uh, first. And, and that doesn't seem to be part of the theological question that he's asking. He's just asking uh, if there are righteous people mixed in with the unrighteous, uh, would you destroy uh, all of them together? And so Abraham is really, it turns out, asking God about salvation. And, and he's the question he's really asking is, wouldn't God rather use the righteous in the city to convert the wicked to righteousness rather than just destroying the whole place? And, and so when we see it that way, it makes a lot more sense. Um, Abraham isn't trying to bargain to save the, the evil city. He's trying to um, uh, ask God, isn't it better to use the righteous people to convert um, the unrighteous people in the city? And this is where it ties into Sarah's womb. Abraham seems to be thinking that in the same way that you... Um, you brought Sarah's womb back to life for Isaac. Can't you bring the city of Sodom back to life using the righteous people that are in the city? And, and it's an interesting thought when you look at it that way. And, and so um, it isn't like he's trying to save the city uh, in the sense of a physical save uh, them. He's trying to save them spiritually. He wants the righteous people to be the, uh, the element that causes uh, salvation to come to, to Sodom. Make some sense? Okay, so um, Abraham is actually challenging God to save them, uh, in, in, is what he's doing. He's saying, um, you, you are righteous, and, and isn't it better to try to save them in a spiritual sense rather than destroying them in a physical sense? And, and, and so he bargains it down. He says, if there are 50 righteous, can you save them? How about if there are 45 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10? If there are just so many, just only 10 people in that city, can you save that city spiritually? Can you use the influence of those 10 righteous people in the city to... Uh, bring the whole city to righteousness. And this kind of harks back to Jonah and Nineveh, if you remember that story. Um, as God wanted uh, Jonah to go to that city, and Jonah knew why. He knew that the city would would, it would accept the message because God had planned it that way, and, and that the people would be saved spiritually. And, and Jonah doesn't like the people of Nineveh. They're a horrible people also. And so Jonah is not so en enthused about this idea of saving them. He would rather see them destroyed. And, and so it, it's, a, it's kind of like uh, the same story with Abraham and Sodom. Uh, Jonah and Nineveh is uh, kind of twisted in a little different way. But, but the ideas are, are still the same in there. The idea that um, God really would rather save a city using the righteous people or using some righteous people, Jonah the prophet in there, and, and bring them back that way rather than destroying them. Okay, so Lot's family has 10 members in Sodom, um, and you, you have to struggle to count that. I, I got that from uh, a Jewish site that said that if you think about it, you can see that there are 10 people there who were part of Lot's family. 
And, and so it seems like that's why Abraham started or stopped at 10. He got it down to 10 because he believed that, or he knew that there were 10 people in Lot's family. And he figured that they were righteous people. And, and, um, and so uh, this is what it says from Genesis 19. It's, uh, this is down in Sodom now. Uh, then the two men said to Lot, who else do you have here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever you have in the city. Bring them out of that place. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons to be jesting. They didn't take him seriously. And, and so um, although there are 10 members in Lot's family in, in Sodom or, or members to be once the marriages are done, um, uh, they do not accept his message and they think that he's, he's joking that God's not going to destroy our city and they don't accept his, his uh, prophecy of, of what's going to be coming. And so Lot is unable to influence them. Naturally, what Abraham was talking about, can't you use the righteous people in the city to influence the entire city to be saved and rather than destroying them? But Lot isn't able to do that. There, there aren't that many people. There aren't even uh, 10 people. Ultimately, you see that there aren't even four people. There's only three people, three righteous people that survive the whole event. And, and God moves them out of the city first for, before destroying the city. <clears throat> Um, I was watching a, a YouTube video about a, a um, archaeology uh, investigation over Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're pretty sure that they found it. And, and I mean, when you go up to those mounds that are out there, it just looks like a bunch of hills. But if you look at it from a distance, it looks like they were buildings at one time that are covered, you know, with ash or whatever. And, and then they show that the reason that they're pretty sure that's the right place is because only in that place will you see uh, particles of sulfur mm -hmm. and brimstone and all that stuff that fell upon them. And the point that this archaeologist was making was too, for too long, people have been explaining away the, the, this, this destruction due to a volcano. But they, there has never been a volcano around it. Mm -hmm. And so they said the only way you have to be able to explain it is biblically, because there's no other way. Because it is only, because none of that uh, um, sulfur, brimstone, whatever that is, is found anywhere around that place except for right there in that location. And it is not, not a natural place to have it. Yeah. In fact, they even put a like a match to it and it just catches fire right, right away uh, it's very flat yeah, uh, yeah. I, i've seen burn, burn, burn. i've seen videos like that yeah sulfur is a nasty stuff if you've ever played with it yourself when you were a child like i did um you, you, once you once you once you light that on on fire you're not putting that out without a gallon of water yeah. um and and um and yeah i've seen videos on that too and they talk about the sulfur being kind of um glassified now there's a little glass coating around those sulfur pellets um, very strange and, and uh, kind of singular thing in the whole earth. Okay, so uh, so God moves them out of the city first, uh, the, the people who are righteous, um, ultimately just three make. Okay, now we're just about done here. Um, so why was Sodom destroyed? Here's the liberal view on that. And, and so here's a, a quote that I found from a university professor. He quotes Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned, lazy or idle. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. Okay, now this is the uh, liberal uh, university professor talking about that. He says, so any place where the people are arrogant, proud, and not helpful to the poor and needy is committing the biblical sin of Sodom. Okay. But scriptural standards, the Trump family are all sodomites. They are also they are, there are sodomites across the political spectrum, liberal as well as conservative. But the Republicans right now seem to have be having the worst problem with rampant sodomy. And anywhere there is a sizable gathering of rich Republicans would count as Sodom. So, <laughs> yes, that's a different take on it. You say, well, I never really did. <laughs> and 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 uh, so, but notice what he's done here. Um, um, it talks about in that Ezekiel verse, they did detestable things before me. He throws that away. The only thing he focuses on, they didn't help the poor and the needy, which are very big things for a liberal, uh, and they were haughty. So he reduces it down to that. And he actually reduces it further than that. 
where the uh, Ezekiel verse says arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned, he, he throws in arrogant, proud, and not helpful to the poor and needy. And so he's he's taken the verse and cut out the parts that he doesn't want and, and made it into something that, that he can uh, say that all Republicans are sodomites from it. But uh, the sin of sodomy, that name has to come from Sodom. I, I, I don't honestly know the, the history of that word, but it, it seems like it comes from that. And, and there's good reasons in the Bible because it talks about what they were doing. And, and But he's going to ignore all of that and decide that it's really just about being arrogant and proud.